Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and in this video I'd like to discuss how the Brexit political debate may shift after the next general election as the conditions may exist for the Conservatives to want to discuss it more frankly and for Labour to have to. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel. So it's a source of frustration for many that there's a political reluctance to talk honestly about Brexit. The Conservatives want to talk about Brexit, but only to continue to peddle lies. Labour and to a lesser extent, the Liberal Democrats are not really talking about it at all in terms of the leaderships. In reality, the problem's not so much with the political parties, but political reality. Target voters for all three parties don't want any hint of the Brexit wounds being reopened. Discussed this a lot. I won't go over that in this in detail now because I want to talk about the future. That's very much about the present. After the general election. Now, after the general election, although we won't get a sudden flip to uh, an honest Brexit debate, it won't be like the floodgates opening, we will have a move towards it. In fact, for the Labour government, there'll be no avoiding it. But I'll come on to that in a few minutes. First, I want to talk about how the Conservatives may wish to talk more frankly about it, because this is absolutely essential. In order for us to get to a position where it's politically settled, we should join the EU. The Conservatives must be on board. If the Conservatives lose the general election, which, which they're going to, they will happily accept that they must change direction. Now, it's not always the case that you need to change policy direction when you lose an election. Sometimes you just ran a bad campaign. But the Conservatives will focus on policies because there are so many groups who want to change. In fact, to be honest, it's hard to identify a type of Conservative that's happy with their current direction. It's all, it's an attempt at compromise that just doesn't work. It's what they've been doing for years. So these various groups will use the defeat as an excuse to get their change of policy. And it could go one of two main ways. The fear is that the Conservatives double down on unrealistic policies built on lies, that they argue, in the case of Brexit, that it was because they didn't unleash it, that Sunak was soft on deregulation, that we didn't put crown stamps on pint glasses, whatever crap they can come up with to justify a much harder Brexit approach. And it may well win out. However, it's not inevitable. It could go the other way. It's been pointed out that the Conservatives have just selected two very interesting candidates to stand in the election in very winnable seats. Seats which, if won, in the long term should be quite safe Tory seats. One of them is Rupert Harrison and the other is Nick Timothy. Now, they were both top advisers in the Cameron and May governments, respectively. They're standing to be candidates, not at a time when the Conservatives are about to come to power, but at a time when there's every chance they're going to begin what might be an extended stay in opposition. So whatever those candidates are standing for, it is not to wheedle their way into government again. So it must be to help shape the immediate future direction of the party to the point where it can form a government at some point in the foreseeable future. Now, in terms of who they would get behind as a leadership choice, I don't know. It depends a great deal on which senior Tory MPs retain their seats. I mean, Swella Braverman has wangled herself an ultra-safe seat, so she's likely to be the most extreme of the credible Brexit candidates. It's hard to see Kemi Badnock being seriously in the mix uh, from a Brexit angle. She keeps being mentioned. Uh, she's certainly a rising star, it seems. But she, I don't see how she could be the champion of Brexit purists because she watered down their precious retained EU law bill. But she's hardly someone who wants to talk honestly about Brexit reality either, so she wouldn't appeal to the other side. So she may well end up being one who draws votes away from someone else. Unless, of course, Braverman is simply too crazy for even the Brexit purists to back. And so they back her as like a Hobson's choice. It's been pointed out that in the event of a real Tory bloodbath at the election, there will be a significant proportion of new MPs making up the parliamentary party. Because there's quite a few Tory MPs, you know, in safe seats that are standing down just because either they've had enough or just because they don't fancy a spell in opposition. I keep saying the vast majority of current Tory MPs have never actually been in opposition. You know, so they don't fancy that. So there's going to be quite a lot of Tory MPs that will have an easy win or candidates, should we say, have an easy win, become Tory MPs that will be new. And they're not responsible for Brexit. They may have supported it. They may not have done, but they're not responsible. 
Also in opposition, the party doesn't have to defend a shady record. They know that when they come back to power, it will be with a clean slate. The fact it was uh, that the, the party was defeated is a chance to say to the electorate, look, you know, you, you kicked us out. We're listening. You're punishing us for getting things wrong. Now, the debate, of course, will be what did they get wrong? The Brexit purists will argue that what they got wrong was not being committed enough to the holy Brexit. But there will be others who will say, no, it's because we, fa we didn't face up to reality. Now, if that second group wins out, even if it takes a bit longer, there'll have to be a more open debate within the party about a range of policy areas. Why did we allow water companies to dump raw sewage? Why did we not build more houses? Why did we allow the asylum backlog to build up? Why did we not do more to help people and businesses cope with the energy crisis where other countries managed it? Why was our inflation remaining high and our growth remaining low? Why did we allow Liz Truss to blow a hole in people's pension funds? And how did our Brexit position influence all of these failures? Most of the new MPs without that political baggage will be concentrated in the Tory heartlands as well. That's worth considering. Here, the voters aren't interested in culture wars. They do care about water quality. They also care about the economy. And if, in parallel to these conversations within the Conservative Party, Labour are quietly getting things done, improving trade, improving water quality, with a more convergent agenda with the EU, it will be harder and harder for the Brexit purists to hold sway. Even if the Conservatives elect a Brexit cultist leader following the election, it won't stop the conversation. Tobias Elwood is currently alone as a Tory backbencher wanting to talk about the damage Brexit is doing and how we should rethink our approach. Now, although the Labour leadership says as little about Brexit as possible, make Brexit work, there are dozens of backbenchers who push the issue all the time. There may also be further pressure from Conservative MPs to want to talk about Brexit more critically. If more target voters start to see Brexit as a busted flush, and especially one that is causing harm, as increasing numbers do, they will want something done about it. Right now, there are a lot of these voters thinking that the Tories have mucked it up, but Labour say they can deal with it, so we'll give Labour a chance. Now, if Labour don't make Brexit work, they will want other solutions. They're not going to be impressed with Sweller Braverman's more of the same but crazier because it was tried, it failed. Especially if Labour's way does make things better. Even if it's not as good as before we left, if it makes things better, it will be obvious what the general direction needs to be. So I can absolutely see the Conservatives being far more sensible as we move through the next Parliament. But what about Labour? Well, there will be a similar change, I feel, but for different reasons. As I see it, there will be two main pressures on Labour. The first is internal. Labour MPs do not, by and large, back Brexit. Right now, they've got their heads in the game and are focused on winning power. After so many years in opposition, they appreciate that they need to be disciplined. So that's what they're doing. They're chuntering, but being disciplined. In power, they will expect that their party actually addresses the problems of the country. Right, we've won the election. Let's do things now. Brexit can no longer be the elephant in the room. It will need dealing with. Initially, there is plenty to do to improve things. But once that is underway, they will be wanting a more long-term plan. Then the second pressure is from the media. Now, right now, Labour have got a, a number of Brexit policies, but every single one of them involves moving close to the EU. Every single one of them is getting back a small amount of what we lost. None of it is a new thing, a third way. But let's look at that Make Brexit Work slogan. Now, it's a marvellous political slogan because it's so ambiguous. What does it mean? Lots of people take it to mean that we will get to a place whereby the UK will be doing better outside the EU than we would have inside it. Now, this, of course, is impossible. However, in opposition, Labour can maintain this line. They've got some policies. If the media asks them, well, what are your policies? Well, these are our policies. And, and that's it. You know, they can just keep saying that. Um, their policies, bear in mind, are not explicitly to, to, to make the UK stronger outside the EU than inside it. But what they have explicitly said is that GDP growth will be the best in the G7. Not easy, not easy at any time, but certainly not easy when we're the only member of the G7 to impose economic sanctions on ourselves. But imagine the scenario. 
Labour have been in power for a couple of years. They've been implementing their policies. They've been working on bilateral agreements with the EU. Hopefully we've seen progress. But a mainstream media that's more than happy to put a Labour government under a harsh spotlight wants a question answered. What are you doing to boost the economy or to otherwise make life better for others that we could not have done in the EU? Because they'll come back to this make Brexit work. What are you doing then to take advantage of the benefits of Brexit? What are you doing that we couldn't have done in the EU? Now, they're not asking that question of the Tories, but I see no reason why they'd avoid asking a Labour government. And what can Labour's response be? See, there are two types of prominent journalists. There's the type which wants the truth, in which case they're not going to accept a load of waffle. And there's the type which bats for the Tories, in which case they absolutely will accept a load of waffle, but not from Labour. Only the Conservatives. So if the only Brexit links with economic growth are reversing Brexit policies and Labour aren't doing anything to boost GDP, which they could not have done in the EU, especially better in the EU, where do they go from there? In order to give voters confidence, they can't look like they're waffling. They're going to be put under a much harsher spotlight. They can't look like they're evading questions. They have to sound like they know what they're doing. They're going to have to start explaining their plans to further boost the economy because their current Brexit policies will have either been implemented or failed by this point. If they want to win the next election, it's like, right, what are you going to do next? What are you doing to boost the economy that we could not do as EU members? Or at the very least, from inside the customs union or the single market, if there is no answer, then there is no way of credibly sticking to a hard Brexit line. And finally, also remember the other dimension, the electorate for the following election will be very different to the one for the next election. 16 and 17 year olds, as well as settled EU citizens, as things currently stand, although Labour haven't announced the detail on that last policy, but it still presents a different electoral landscape. So I think the main parties are holding ground on Brexit until the election, but that that ground will shift during the next parliament because there will be immense pressure for it to do so. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.